Oh, such an honor to be here today. I'm not the only one that feels Jesus in this place, right? <laughs> You're going to have to forgive me. I am a hot mess today. I am, <clears throat> I'm trying to hold it together, okay? So if I end up on the floor, somebody else grab the microphone. No, <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, I could actually lay on the floor and just worship God and cry like a baby. That's how I'm feeling right now, but I know I have a word from God that I need to preach, so, so uh, we're going to go there. But first, before we get started, I want to honor Pastor Jason. Um, he is a good friend of mine, and he is a mentor, and he is, a, he is an encouragement. And I know that no matter what time of day or what day, if you call that man, he is excited about Jesus. Right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah clap for that. Come on. Yeah. To have a man of God in the place that is, his mind is set like concrete. When concrete sets, it just, it's just there. You know what I mean? <laughs> You're not doing anything about it. His mind is set on Christ and set on building, building his church, you know, Jesus' church, and reaching people and, and, and reaching the lost and encountering God. That is a beautiful thing. That's an honorable thing. And when you've been around a lot of places, listen, it's a rare thing. So you definitely have something special in this place. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 8. First Kings chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 1. Hey, there we go. So it says, Now Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes and the, and the chief fathers of the children of Israel to King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the city of David, which is Zion. Therefore, all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim. This is the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the seventh month. So all the elders of Israel came, and the priest took up the ark. Then they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tabernacle of meeting, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle, the priests and the Levites brought them up. So this is the dedication of the first temple. We're going to get to the next scripture in a second. This is the dedication of the first temple. This is the tabernacle under Moses in the wilderness in building form, okay? And, and they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant, the central worship piece of the nation, into the temple. Verse 10. And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place. So they had placed the Ark of the Covenant in there. When they came out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. Notice that the temple is also called the house of the Lord. Next verse. So that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. Now the King James says they couldn't even stand because of the cloud. I like that. <laughs> for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord so God I pray that that you would breathe on this word today in Jesus name amen amen so lay a little groundwork you remember Solomon Solomon's the one that built this temple if you remember right his father David I'm talking about King David he's the one that wanted to build this place for God and God said look I can't let you do that why because you're a man of war you have too much blood on your hands but I'll let your son do it right I'm talking about King David King David was not a man that was easily intimidated let me talk to the men for a minute <laughs> because it's believed on in the world if you go out here in society and you go out in the secular world it's believed among men that if you identify with Jesus that you have to become less manly 
that somehow you have to give up your masculine card when you walk in the building. That's, that's the lie that's believed in the world. But when I read my Bible, I don't see weak men. I see people like David. David was called a mighty man, a man of war. The men that walked with him were known as mighty men. These, these are the kind of men that you didn't want to get on the wrong side of. You, you see what I'm saying? Like, like people like Moses. I'm talking about the main characters in the Bible. They weren't weak and timid. They were tough and masculine. Not secondary characters. The main characters. Loved God with all their heart, but yet were not easily, like they were not pushovers. Do you, are you following me? People like Moses. Moses seen an Egyptian taskmaster beating on a Hebrew. He walks up and kills the man and then buries him in the sand. How would you like to have a pastor like that? <laughs> I'm just saying like you do something funny in church and he look at you. You know I killed a man, right? You know, like, <laughs> like you're on your best behavior around that dude. And then like people like Peter. They came up to arrest Jesus, right? And Peter's standing there. The soldier that came up to put Jesus in cuffs, Peter pulled a blade out and cut the dude's ear off. I, I'm, you see, I'm talking about the kind of guys, you know? Like, like, I'm just saying, been walking with Jesus for three and a half years, and dude had a blade on him somewhere is what I'm saying. Y'all get that, right? And, and he's the kind of guy that says, listen, you're not going to walk up and put your hands on someone I care about and me stand there and not do something about it. Come on, do I have any men in the house this morning? I'm, I'm talking about the kind of guys that walked with Jesus. The kind of guys that love God with all their heart. And then you, we have Jesus, John chapter 2, made a whip. And walked up in the temple and drove the animals out of the temple and flipped over the tables and the money changers and cleared the place. And listen, no one pushed him to the ground and said, get out of here, you chump. Why? Because he was not Barney Fife. Okay? That's what... Y'all get that. Jesus was a tough man. Jesus was a manly man. He was a, mas he was a man's man. You see, you see what I'm saying? I was, uh, I was meeting with a family a couple of weeks ago, and they need a new roof on their house. And I, I, they, they got a couple of bids on it, and they, it was really high, and they said, listen, we can, we can buy the materials, but we can't afford to pay a contractor to do it. It's just too much money. And I said, well, that's fine. I'll run the job. I'll get some guys from the church. You buy the materials. I'll gather some men from the church, and we'll come and knock this thing out for you, you know? Be in the church to the people, right? And then, so I said, I'm going to need some more help. They go to church every week, another church in town, big church. And I said, do you have any men in your church that would be willing to help? I just, I'll run the job. I just need some hands, like to throw some shingles in the dumpster and, you know, carry some stuff up a ladder and just basic stuff. And they said... You know, not really. Like, we don't have any men in our church like that. And it should have shocked me, but it didn't. So could it be, could it be that the men view the church as being only a place for women and children? I'm just being real today. Could it be that these men are on the outside looking in and saying, I don't feel accepted there. There's not a place there for me. It's only a place for my wife and daughter and my wife and kids. And I want to say this, that there is a place in the kingdom for men. Would you agree with that? That the church does not only exist for women and children. But in addition to that, we need that as well. Don't get me wrong. Don't, don't hear what I'm not saying, okay? Hear what I am saying. In addition to that, we, it is also a place for men. Amen? And, and I want to say this to, to every man. Every man, stand up on your feet in this place this morning. I want to do something in here. Praise God. Clap your hands for the men in here.
I want to say this to you and, and every person watch it online. Listen, the church needs you. We need you with all your manliness. We need you with all your masculinity. We need what you bring to the table. You, you understand what I'm saying? There is a place in the kingdom for biblical men of God. Listen, our boys need you. Your boys need other men as well, not just you. That we need men of God to demonstrate what it means to walk in integrity, to walk in good character, how to treat women, all that stuff. We need men of God in this country, in this society, in this community. Would you agree with that? Come on, clap your hands in this place. You guys can be seated. I'm going to get to my message eventually. I'm feeling something on that. So Solomon built this temple. God wouldn't let David do it. Solomon built it. And he spared no expense. This temple was amazing. If this building was still around today, it would be one of the wonders of the world. Okay? It, it took 150,000 masons and, and stone haulers. That's not 15,000. That's 150,000. All right, um, 30,000 laborers, 3,300 supervisors, and, and the, the, the work continued nonstop for seven years. And, and, and uh, the floors and the walls were overlaid with gold. This place was, was amazing. So it's the temple, and I was trying to explain this to my wife, bless her soul, she said, I need pictures. <laughs> and I was probably being confusing, you know, and all that stuff. So, so basically, the temple consisted of three main parts. It's much deeper than this, but please work with me. It was basically the Holy of Holies. That's the innermost part of the temple. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was. This is where the presence of God dwelt. Then outside of that, you had what was known as the inner court. This is where the Levitical priesthood did their ministry. Then out of, outside of that, you had the outer court. So three main parts. Holy of Holies, inner court, outer court. We all get that so far. And I was reading in the New Testament, and Paul said to the church, to the ecclesia, to the called out ones, he said, don't you guys know that you, as a whole, as a church, you are the temple of God? So I got to investigating that. And, it, and I feel like God opened up something powerful to me about it. So the, 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 if the church is the temple of God, then the Holy of Holies, the, the, the high priest went in there once a year to, to perform an act of worship. He sprinkled the blood on the, on the, the Ark of the Covenant. I saw this this morning. I was like, man, that's cool. I called Jason about it too, but anyway. <laughs> they, he went in there once a year as an act of worship on behalf of the nation and sprinkled the blood on the Ark of the Covenant. The Holy of Holies, if the church is the temple of God, the Holy of Holies speaks to each individual believer is called to have a personal relationship, a personal time of worship, and a personal time of prayer with God one-on-one. -on -one. As an individual believer, I'm talking about praying when nobody else is praying with you. I'm talking about worshiping God when no one else is around. Right? I'm talking about opening up your heart and exposing the, the secret most part of who you are with God one-on-one -on -one as an individual. This is the Holy of Holies. And I found out that a lot of people struggle with this part of their relationship with God. Like, we're okay calling ourselves a Christian, right? And we're okay coming to church. But it's another thing to open up your heart and really draw close to God like a father-daughter, father-son relationship. I found out a lot of people struggle with this. And I asked God, you know, why is that? Why, do, why does it seem like it's such a hard thing for people to, to get? And I felt like he told me it's because of how they view him. It's because of how they view God. 
Let, let me say it like this. If you think God's a mean person, listen, you don't draw close to mean people. You can, you can uh, believe in a mean person all day. You can identify with a mean person. But you're, you avoid mean people at work. Like you work with them enough to get the job done, but you don't get personal with them, right? If you think God's a mean person, if you think God's judgmental, if you think God's critical, then you're not going to want to get close to God. You can believe in him, but it's another thing to take something that's precious to you, the inside of the depth of who you are as a person, and hand it to him. That's a whole nother level, right? It's getting deep in here, all right? I'm trying to help somebody this morning. So, but the Bible says that God is kind. The Bible says God is good. The Bible says God is compassionate and full of mercy and wants an intimate relationship with you, right? Look, look at some of these scriptures. I'm going to read them to you here. Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 25, 8 through 9. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his way. He guides the humble in what is right. Psalm 145, 8 through 9. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. This is what God says about himself. The Lord is good to all and has compassion on all he has made. Psalm 145, 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. But if we think that everything bad that has happened in our life, if we think that every time we've experienced a setback or a tragedy or something detrimental has happened in our life, if we think ultimately that happened because it was God's will, then listen, if that's your belief system about God, you have no room in your theology for a devil. All right? You have no room in your theology for free will or a fallen world. Do you see what I'm saying? If, if, if you think that everything that has happened in your life is ultimately God's fault, then it's no wonder why you scroll on your phone at 10, 1030 at night till you pass out. Then it's no wonder why you flip through the TV channel until you can't hold your eyes open. Why? You're avoiding a personal heart connection with God. Because in, inwardly, you think he's a mean person. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm trying to help somebody this morning. Is everybody all right in here? <laughs> so, our belief system about God cannot come from movies. It can't come from life experience. It can't come from what other people say. It's got to come from his word. Our definition of who God is has to come from how he has defined himself. All right? Let me move on before I get shouted down. <laughs> the Bible says it's the devil that came to steal, kill, and destroy. Is that right? That, that Jesus came to give you life and life to the fullest. The Bible says it's the devil that walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. God's not doing that stuff. But if we think he is, the one that is causing that to happen secretly in the back, that he's, then it's no wonder why we don't open up our heart to him. Amen? I think I hammered that home. I'm going to move on. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, that is the Holy of Holies, as each individual believer is called to have a personal relationship, personal time of worship, personal time of prayer with God one on one. Then, the next phase of the temple is called the inner court. This is where the Levitical priesthood did their ministry. This is where the showbread was, this is where the wash, wash basins were. This is where the candlestick was. The Levitical priesthood did their ministry in the inner court. Yes. What that speaks to is what we are doing this morning. That each individual priest, we're called kings and priests unto our God, right? We are a holy priesthood. 
Each individual priest comes together corporately to give God praise and to worship God. This is what we are doing this morning. This is the inner core. And listen, this can never be replaced. You are not going to get the same thing online. You are not going to get the same thing in another gathering. Because Jesus gave us a promise. He said, where two or three are gathered together in his name, he said, there am I in the midst of them. There is nothing like the presence of God. Nothing like the presence. The Bible says in his presence is the fullness of joy. The Bible says that, that, that times of refreshing come from what? The presence of the Lord. We all need refreshing in life. Is that right? Listen, you can come in this place feeling, feeling super defeated and you can have your hope restored. You can come in here feeling stressed and leave with peace. You can come in here feeling beat down by life and taken advantage of by people and somehow at your wit's end and you can walk out of here with your head held high in a place of victory. Does anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? That you, you, you can be refreshed just being in the house of the Lord around the people of God and we learn from the word. And we grow in our faith and our relationship with one another and refreshment and blessing and healing and restoration can come to your life in a moment. Amen? I'm all the way off somewhere else now. but <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews 10.25, let's throw this on there. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. Some people are like that. Some people forsake the assembling of... The Bible says don't do that. Here's my pastoral advice to you. Don't do that. Okay? <laughs> Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. So... Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That is the one thing that separates the church from every other gathering in the world. Is the fact that we have a promise from God. That if we would gather together in his name, that he would be with us. Yes. Amen. Amen. So... Life happens and things try to come on your schedule and, and certain things come up in life in the kids' lives and stuff like this. To the Christian, it ought to be essential to say, no, this is, this, this is not movable. Sunday morning getting together with the people of God and worshiping God corporately, right? That should be something that is essential for every Christian. That when things try to come against... I'm not talking about vacations and special events. Please hear me. I'm talking about generally. Generally speaking, we should say, no, this is essential and it is immovable. That I am going to get together with the people of God. That I'm going to bring my kids in here. I'm going to bring my family in here. And we're going to give God praise corporately as, as a body. Is that right? Yeah. That ought to be essential in the Christian's life. So I feel like that is the inner court, is what we're doing today. And then, I'm, I'm close, this is my first closing, okay? <laughs> then um, you have what was known as the outer court. So you have the Holy of Holies, each individual believer is called to have a personal relationship, personal time of worship, personal time of prayer with God as, a, as an individual. The inner court. We're called to come together corporately as a body of believers to give God praise and to worship Him. And then you have the outer court. This was, you did not have to be in the Levitical priesthood to be in the outer court, okay? This was open and exposed to everyone. The outer court speaks of the marketplace. And notice what we read in the text. It said, the glory of the Lord, the cloud, filled the house of the Lord. It didn't just fill the Holy of Holies. It filled the whole house. See, you can experience God's presence and God's glory in your personal prayer closet, in your personal time of worship, in your personal Bible reading. 
you can also experience his presence in this. Something was happening in this atmosphere today. Would you agree with that? When we, became, when we came together and began to worship God, something was happening in here. I was a hot mess up here, feeling the presence of God. It was beautiful. And, and we learn from the word and, and we're fellowshipping with one another. But you can also experience God's presence in the marketplace. That we're called to worship God in the marketplace. Now, I am not talking about being at Meyer, standing at the meat section, and you see the meat's down $3 and oh, hallelujah, Jesus, in front of everybody. You know, I, I'm not talking about that kind of worship of God in the marketplace, okay? <laughs> dance a jig and pray in tongues or something, you know. I'm talking about practical stuff. I'm talking about living for God. I'm talking about caring about people and being kind, being friendly, smiling, being approachable, not being a religious weirdo, okay? <laughs> All right? I'm, I'm talking about living for God in the workplace, at the grocery store, at the ball game, helping people, letting your light so shine before others that they may see who you are and what you're about and see your heart and say, man, I want what they have. I got a testimony of a guy that the guy was in a very bad place, very miserable, came to work every day, just grumpy and hard, you know. You wouldn't talk to him for the first 30 minutes because you knew it wouldn't be good. One of those kind of people. And there's another guy at work fired up for Jesus, happy as could be. Reminds me of Bob. <laughs> Just always excited about the kingdom. Lovely guy, you know. Well, this guy, this grumpy guy said, dude, what's your deal, man? Why are you always so happy? And, he, and he, this is the grumpy guy testifying to me. He said, man, Robert, that guy looked at me and said one word. He said, Jesus. And he turned around and walked off. And he, th this, was, this was a year and a half ago. This guy sitting down with me crying last week, giving his life to Christ. You see what I'm saying? Because, because of the testimony of a lifestyle of loving God and caring about people and being friendly and being kind. And even though he's getting lashed out at, he's not lashing back. You see what I'm saying? But he's loving people, even if they appear to be unlovable. That's what it means to worship God in the marketplace. That's what it means to be about the Father's business. Amen? Amen. So Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel, right? He's saying, as you go, as you go, just be about the gospel. Amen? Amen. Love God, love others, be happy. It's contagious. So we as a church are called the temple of God. That God's presence can fill every area of your life. The Bible says the presence of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And, it, and His glory rested in that place, right? I'm telling you, personal experience, you can, you can experience that kind of stuff every day in your life, every phase of your life every situation you find yourself in God can be with you in that amen? amen amen let's clap our hands in here this morning if you all would bow your heads with me I want to pray for us hallelujah hallelujah thank you father if we could just keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed, and I just want to talk to us just for a moment. I felt God really hitting in on some people and, and, and dialing in on some folks when, when I talked about keeping Him at a distance. And you may be in here today, and listen, you believe in God. And you're saved, and you love God. But you've yet to open up and really let Him into the depth of who you are. I feel like I'm talking to some people today. You believe in him, you love him, but you're still holding him at a distance. Still holding on to the pain, still holding on to the setbacks, still holding on to the hurt. 
And I want to say this to you today. Listen, there is no better place for you than to have your heart opened up all the way to a loving father. Listen to me. When God touches pain, it does not hurt. When God touches pain, it goes away. And if that's you in here today, I just, I want you to surrender it all. You tell God, listen, I'm not holding back. I refuse to stiff arm you any longer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, get him. Get him, Jesus. Get him, Jesus. You're a loving father. You're a good God. If that's you in here today and you feel God touching your life and touching your heart, listen, just let all the barriers down. Just let it go. Let it go and open up your heart to him like you never have before. Listen, it is safe. It's a safe place. It's a good place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So God, I pray that every barrier that is standing between that kind of intimacy with you, I pray that it be broken down right now in Jesus' name. Every false belief system, every, every barrier, every chain, every, everything that has set itself up in between that place of intimacy with you, I pray that it be broken down right now in the name of Jesus in every person's life under the sound of my voice. That we would know what it means to be real intimate with you. That we would know what it means to have a personal relationship with you. I pray for breakthrough for every person. And God, I pray in Jesus' name that we would have a hunger and a desire and something on the inside of us that's driving us to get to the house of God, to fellowship with the people of God, to come in here and worship God corporately. I pray that there would be a passion stirred up in the people of God like never before, that we have to get to the house, that we've got to get around other believers, that we've got to give God praise a hunger and a burning desire in each person. And Father, I pray for divine encounters and opportunities to worship you in the marketplace. Not to be weird, but to be real and to lead people into an encounter with your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Everybody all right? Now, hey, I love y'all. I know it was a little tough, but I love you now, okay? <laughs> so, um, I don't ever want to close a service out without offering prayer, without offering love. If we could have the prayer team, those that, were, that are usually come up front to pray with people, if we could have you just move forward, we can go ahead and cut the camera if that's okay. If you guys would come forward. I don't want to end the 